Um, well, I'm actually going to start off here in London. Um, I came in June uh, to Senate House uh, to the um, International Paleography Summer School. And the first person I met when I arrived was Julia. She said, oh, are you teaching a course? I said, no, I'm a student. Um, I came to do the Greek paleography class. Um, we've got Greek manuscripts in the library. There's nobody to um, work on them. So I said, OK, I have to brush up my very rusty Greek and uh, go and learn some Greek paleography. And it was really useful. Um, lots of helpful hints on how to date Greek manuscripts. Slightly complicated by the tendency of Greek, scri Greek scribes to archaize their scripts. Um, so you can have what appears on first glance to be the same script, and it's two or three centuries later. Um, but by the end of the two days, I felt more confident about dealing with the Greek manuscripts in my collection, which was really the point of the exercise. But actually, it also made me think about um, the experience of teaching and learning. How often these days do we genuinely learn something new? Um, how often do we put ourselves in the position of being a student again? And it was a really useful experience for me to sit in that classroom, puzzling over these horrendous um, Greek manuscripts, some of them, um, to, to be back in that situation. Um, and it made me think about when I first learned Latin paleography a long time ago at the University of Leeds. Um, but essentially, there was very little difference in the approach. Um, this is one of the um, pages that the, that the tutor gave us uh, on the Greek paleography. Um, it's fine. It's uh, perfectly readable. How's your Greek paleography? Um, and I'm sure sheets like this are really familiar um, to those of you who learned paleography as long ago as I did. You get a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a plate from a book uh, of a manuscript. Uh, now, I know that this, uh, obviously, Codex Sinaticus is fine, but if I want to transcribe Codex Sinaticus, this is much better, isn't it? Not only because it's already got the answers, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> the transcription provided, um, to check your answers, uh, but this is better because you can zoom in. Ah, better still, you can even um, read the, uh, the comments and the, uh, the interlinear glosses. So I know, I work with digital images. Uh, if I'm going to be transcribing texts, I really want to be working from nice images. So, but that aside, I mean, the, the Paleography Summer School was great. Um, as you may have noticed, it's changed its name uh, this year. It's now the London International Paleography Summer School. So it has a nice acronym, so it can be LIPS. Um, but also because it, it genuinely is international. I was the only um, British person in the class. There were um, half a dozen Italians in the class. There was a Greek person who was very helpful um, learning Greek paleography. There were people from uh, the US, from Germany, from Costa Rica. It was a genuinely international experience and we bonded together over Greek paleography. This is really easy Greek paleography. I, it's, it gets a lot harder, I promise you. Um, so it was useful, uh, but finding a Greek paleography course, they don't come up very often. You have to come all the way to London. It's a big investment of time and money, um, um, particularly for some of the, the students, to be there. So there are other ways of learning paleography. And I know that uh, not least because I was involved in a MOOC. Uh, this is one of the screenshots from the MOOC, um, Digging Deeper. Uh, it's the brainchild of Elaine Trahan of Stanford University, who is a, a good friend of DigiPal. Um, she would be here if she wasn't taking her students on a mad tour of Britain at the moment. Um, so she applied for funding from Stanford. Um, they were interested in developing online learning in the humanities, having had a lot of success um, with courses in computer science and databases and that kind of thing. Thousands of people around the world signing up. Um, so they wanted to do something in humanities, and um, Elaine got some funding. It's hosted on the um, Open edX platform, which is an open source version of edX, which is used by a number of universities around the world. And Elaine came up with the idea of um, an introductory course on medieval manuscripts. 
And one of the aims of it, as far as possible, was to bring the experience of those introductory manuscript courses that we all do, we all teach, um, bringing that to a wider audience. The kind of course that you get when you start out on an MA in medieval studies or medieval history or literature. Um, perhaps thinking about those grad students in places that don't have manuscript collections, um, that maybe don't have experienced medievalists, uh, experienced paleographers to teach them, um, to, give, to provide some resources for them. And it was also intended to answer the kinds of questions that people always ask when they see manuscripts for the first time. Um, I spend a lot of my day introducing people to manuscripts and they 90% of them ask the same questions. What's it made of? When was it made? How long did it take to make? How much is it worth? Um, who used it? Who made it? What were the contexts? Tell me about the ink. Tell me about the pens. Tell me about the parchment, everything. That ki those kinds of questions um, that, that people are interested in. So that was one part of the course. And the second element was practical paleography. So that is giving students an opportunity to develop their transcription skills. Uh, drawing on the high resolution digital images of manuscripts um, that we have in Cambridge and that they had in Stanford. And Elaine invited me, um, Orietta, who's already spoken, and Ben, who's going to speak later, friends of DigiPal, um, to come along and to be involved in front of camera. But there was also a huge team behind the camera, um, literally, not just people holding the cameras, um, but also project managers, learning technologists, um, animators, people who are experienced in working in online learning environments. And I do want to stress in this presentation that this was not my accomplishment. I'm not here talking about something I have done. Um, I actually played a very small part in the paleography element. Most of it was done by Elaine um, and the team at Stanford. So we filmed sequences um, in 2014. Um, Elaine, Ben and the crew came over to Cambridge and we filmed in the summer. Um, and then I went out to Stanford in November where the weather was pretty much the same as it was in summer in Cambridge. I was wearing the same you know, summer shirt in November in California. Um, shooting more manuscript um, commentaries and discussions. Um, and then it, the courses went live um, from, we ended up dividing it into two, Digging Deeper One ran from January to March uh, this year, and Digging Deeper Two ran in April and May. So the first was six weeks and then five weeks. Um, so in terms of the practical element, the, the transcription, we were very conscious we wanted to um, make it as wide-ranging as possible. Um, so we wanted to include Latin and Old English, of course, um, Middle English and French. So we wanted to give people a flavour of all those things. And of course, we couldn't assume any linguistic knowledge on the part of the, um, of the participants. So in some ways, it was pretty traditional. There's Elaine. Um, so we started off in the first week with this video, How to Transcribe, which is basically Elaine sitting with um, a photocopy of a manuscript page and a pen, a pencil and paper, explaining precisely in detail how she would set about transcribing uh, this manuscript. Um, so, uh, and Elaine basically pretty much as she was taught um, a few years ago, that you underline your expansion of abbreviations, that you make a note of any literary notabiliores, you make a note of, of um, rubrics, um, you make how to encode in your pencil and paper corrections, additions, that kind of thing. And then each week we had a different example, a different script, um, you know, proceeding from, as you might expect, Caroline minuscule, um, some English vernacular minuscule, some proto-Gothic, early Gothic, later Gothic uh, textura hands. We were merciful, we didn't go beyond um, later Gothic. So every week they had a few lines to transcribe and we suggested to them that they, um, that they work on paper and then copy it into the box. I mean, one of the difficulties, and this is something where I wish we'd had um, the 
uh, the T pen ability to cut the text into lines. As you can see, the box is here, the start of the manuscript page is here. It was really difficult within the software to, um, to fit everything onto the screen. And particularly as we couldn't guarantee what sort of devices people would be using to access the course, um, quite a lot of the students were using tablets. And of course, if you've got a tablet, uh, once you, the keyboard comes up, you've got a very limited amount of screen real estate. Um, so it makes it more complicated. Um, so this was one of the issues. Um, so one of the one of the things we did was we um, embedded um, full page uh, full page PDFs of the manuscript or full page pop up of the manuscript page, so that uh, you could have that uh, if that was helpful if you were working on paper, um, so that people could see the whole page. I mean another issue is in terms of how you determine whether something is correct. Basically, the software would give you a mark if you just typed anything into the box. It really wasn't about um, assessing how correct their transcription was. So this sort, of, um, this sort of approach is not really appropriate if you actually want the students work to be marked in that way um, and I think this is part of the nature of a MOOC and this is something I only really understood by being involved in it it's really self-directed it was really down to the students themselves they could press that button that says show answer and see the transcription bam you see the transcription how much do you learn Meh, maybe a little bit or you could go away Google research stare at the screen for hours on end, and then put your transcription in, then press show answer. It's re it was really down to the students themselves how much work they wanted to put in. Um, and a lot of them put in a lot of work. And we did learn a lot from the participants. I think this is, the, this is my big takeaway um, from the MOOC. Um, Elaine and the team at Stanford were really responsive uh, in responding to the, to the feedback of the participants. Um, every week they came up with ideas, things they needed, things they wanted, things they'd found for themselves, um, and we were kind of working behind the scenes to incorporate that into the next, into the next week. Um, they liked to talk about how easy or difficult they found it, what, what elements, um, what they got stuck on, how they solved their problems. And it became clear to us that they needed a little more help um, Elaine added some uh, guidance on diplomatic, semi-diplomatic transcription, just a very step-by-step -step guide. Um, we added bibliography, uh, places they could go. Um, I mean, one of the issues is, of course, dealing with special characters, um, dealing with punctuation. See here, this is week one. Um, the text contains a punctus elevatus. Use a standard semicolon to signify this mark. So in the beginning, you know, we just kind of fudged it. Later on, we um, developed, we, we allowed them to, to, to in incorporate um, punctuation and, and incorporate um, special characters into their transcription. Um, oh. So we put in extra help uh, on the week when they had to transcribe Old English, um, you know, explaining to them about special characters. Obviously, a link to DigiPal, uh, anything to do with uh, Old English, you'd want to be pointed in that direction. Um, and also pointing to Peter Baker's introduction to Old English. We did encourage them. One of the things we said to them was, try writing out an alphabet for each script. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty standard technique. I don't know how many of them actually did it, how many of them actually looked at the manuscript page and wrote out their own alphabets. Some did, um, but otherwise, I mean, it's, it was helpful to have, uh, to have this kind of thing. Um, and then we put in, the, we gave them the special characters for them to add in, in much the same way as uh, uh, Katie was talking about with, with the alpha-rich that you can um, copy, copy the characters in. Um, and another thing that actually went down really well, was actually really useful for them, which I, uh, never particularly occurred to me, they really liked to have the translation. 
they really liked to know what it was they were transcribing. Um, and even if they didn't actually know anything of the language, most of them had no Latin, almost all of them had no Old English, but they liked to know what it was they were translating, even if it was completely out of context and it was only a couple of lines, um, they liked to know what it was. Um, obviously, the, um, the problem of abbreviations, we ended up just uh, giving them some help, sort of cutting and pasting bits of Capelli that would be useful to them. If any of you have tried to use the online Capelli PDFs and such as it is, some of the students did, they got stuck in with it, uh, but we decided in the end that it was easier just to, to supply them with the bits they needed. And you could scaffold that um, in terms of how much help you, you give. Um, in terms of the student responses, uh, the headline, tricky but enticing, was really my favourite comment. That, that was how it pretty much sums up their comments. Um, and at, at different levels, you know, some of them were more um, specific than others, some of them were more frustrated than others. Um, but it, it was really helpful for us to see precisely what bits uh, they were finding difficult. And we also had some useful reminders that not everyone looks at a manuscript page in the same way. Um, there was a surprisingly large number of conservators um, taking the course, and they look at a manuscript page in a way that is very different. Um, so then, uh, and that was useful because that's in the forum, that's public, it sends other participants back to look at the page and look at the Japanese paper and look at the repair and go, oh, I hadn't noticed that. Um, so that she got responses from other people saying, thanks for pointing that out. Um, and there's also a sense of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, students sharing useful websites they found or techniques they would found helpful. I mean, it's clear that some of them had really spent hours puzzling over it. Um, if they got a word they weren't sure of, translating it and comparing it with the translation. Uh, and, uh, so they started discussions among themselves. And it became apparent on the forum that um, not all the students were as unfamiliar with medieval manuscripts uh, as others. Uh, so somebody who said, OK, we didn't have to transcribe, but what is that word? Uh, and someone else comes in and says, oh, maybe you should look at it like this. It's a teachable moment. And of course, I looked at this and I thought, Marjorie, 77, she knows a lot about manuscripts. Uh, many of you will know Marjorie Burkhardt of uh, the <laughs> University of Lyon, um, taking the course, helping us out, and uh, you know, passing on her words of wisdom. Have fun, she says at the end. That's, yes, OK. In Digging Deeper 2, we up the difficulty levels a bit. Um, one of the weeks, we dealt with musical manuscripts. And the transcription exercise was a few lines from a manuscript of Guillaume de Machot. Um, now, I have to say, in all my years, I have never try, tried to transcribe a secular music manuscript. I don't know if any of you have. But I would bet everyone in this room um, with the exception of Ben at the back, um, would learn something from this exercise. He wrote it, so everyone else would, would learn something. Um, it, even experienced paleographers, there was something to learn about how to, um, how to deal with music texts, how they're laid out on the page, um, how the words and music fit together. Um, I definitely learned a lot from that exercise. Another thing... Um, we managed to introduce within the, seg the second uh, Digging Deeper course. And it's, it's pretty impressive considering that this went live only a month after the first one finished. Um, the team at Stanford really worked on this to introduce a full character map to enable um, formatting so that you could put, um, so you could um, add the colored text that you could use underlining for the um, expansion of abbreviations. Um, this really made the transcription a lot easier. So it's just some things that we learned as we went on that this, this sort of thing uh, was useful. Um, but not everyone was happy with it, this new transcription tool. 
So, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. A zong. I think a zong is a yog. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. I like thorn and Yeah. Yeah, they were given Chaucer a laptop. Okay. This is... Um, this is what happens when you give people old, um, Middle English manuscripts to, uh, to transcribe. So what did, what did we learn from this experience? I think, <laughs> well, we, yeah, we learned that uh, a zong is, <laughs> is a cool thing. Um, it was intense and exhilarating, I hope Orietta <laughs> and Ben would agree. It was, um, it was teaching, but not as we know it. Um, I mean, we all did our best to get on the forums to answer questions. Um, but people all around the world were firing in questions 24-7 pretty much while the course was running. Um, I think I also learned about um, just how much you can learn from your students, just how much they can, uh, they can tell you. Heaven forbid there was one mistake in the transcription one week. Oh my God, everybody spotted it. And we just had to, you know, a deliberate mistake. Well done, well done. Um, <laughs> The students really, really enjoyed the transcription. They, it was, uh, most of the students that I've spoken to, it was their favourite part of the course. They really enjoyed developing a concrete skill. Um, how much they go on to use it, I don't know. But um, a lot of MOOCs are very much uh, conceptual. This, they really felt that they were learning something and they could see their progress. They could see it getting easier week by week. Um, as they mastered letter forms and they mastered abbreviations. And I do think it was valuable to have that combination of the transcription with the sort of broader um, concept of, of manuscripts and genres of manuscript and that kind of thing. Um, it, it set the paleography in context. The two elements worked together quite well. I think I was surprised, in terms of what I learned, I was surprised at just how much time some people were prepared to spend uh, poring over the exercises, investigating online resources. Um, they were really tenacious, some people. I was also surprised at, at the range of people taking the course. Um, the number of people that come up to me, I don't know, Orietta, Ben, if you have the same thing, the number of people that come up to me and say, saw you on the, saw you on the internet, I've seen you on this course. <laughs> Okay, it's fine. Um, a lot of people, a lot of academics, a lot of students, I mean, a lot of grad students um, have taken it, but it's worldwide. We had participants from over 100 countries. Uh, we had thousands of people, a, a very sizable minority of them non-native speakers of English. Um, you know, respect to the guy in Nepal who's there uh, looking at old English manuscripts and uh, the people in China, people all around the world. Um, at, at the end of the course, I actually issued an invitation to all the participants so that they could come to Cambridge and see the manuscripts in the flesh. And luckily, they haven't all taken me up on it. <laughs> 10,000 of them all turning up. Um, but Orietta and I have hosted a number of groups. We've had people come for that meetup, especially from Switzerland, from the Netherlands, from Ireland, as well as right the way across the UK. Um, We've had all sorts of people. Um, we've had a, uh, one guy I spoke to, he's a consultant anaesthetist. We've had computer programmers, retired vicars, everybody. So I think uh, I've learned that these MOOCs are, they have a use, they have a place in the teaching of paleography. Um, they've made me a better teacher in my everyday work. This is the kind of thing I do um, generally. And I think there, are, there is room for them. The idea of having online training available at any time to people who may be very far from medieval manuscripts and paleographers. And I've also learned that there's a lot of scope still for developing new, new tools. Uh, I mean, if anybody can find a replacement for Capelli in an online context, brilliant. And something for Greek manuscripts as well, please. That would be very nice. And as a curator who wants her collection to be seen and used and appreciated and understood by the widest possible audience, I think it's great uh, that these manuscripts are out there, that we're making use of the digital images that we've got in this way and that we're, we're kind of getting people to, to know about what we've got and what we do. Um, 
And I'm looking forward to Digging Deeper 3 coming in January next year. Fantastic, Suzanne. Thank you very much. That's a really, really good example, I, I think, about how we all learn from each other. Mm. One of the great things about the MOOC is the asynchronous nature. Mm. Yeah? So the students can have time to think and reflect before they respond. And also, of course, we learn from them as well, mm. which I think is something that all our students forget, but how much we actually learn from looking at mm. one of them now, how much <laughs> we actually learn from our students. Yeah? It is true. Okay. <laughs> Uh, quick questions before lunch. Otherwise, it's going to be more questions from me. And I've, you've heard my voice too much already. Have you seen much engagement with the courses outside of the sort of designated teaching fields? Mm. Do you still get people interacting with them on the forums and so on? Or? Not so much on the forums, but um, I mean the courses are still available. You can you can go through them and looking at. I mean, I just looked at the registrations. There's still about forty people a week registering for the course, even though it you know, finished six months ago. Um, I mean, it may be that we do another iteration uh, at some point, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it has a long tail in, the, in that sense. People will still use the materials. We're very pleased to see this is on the open edX one, mm. so it's on a free open source platform, which is, which is really great as well. I did some research on teaching resources in classics, which is my original discipline, and I could find very, very little. So this is a similar related, particularly with the inclusion of the, the, the Greek manuscripts in that would go well together with that. So I'm going to include this in my um, digital classes wiki page on teaching resources now we've got this. Um, have you looked at, we have a paparo, 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 I can't, there's lots of words I can't say. <laughs> Paparological editor. This is um, something that sits in GitHub, mm. um, which we have an interface. This is uh, one of Gabriel's projects, an interface which uh, the students can transcribe and it automatically converts into uh, TEI compliant XML in the epitop format. So it's not only it's not only looking at inscription on stone, it's also looking at mm. this particular project is looking at um, writing on, on papyri. Uh, yeah, I think that is one of the things for future will be in terms of really looking at that the, the element of description and how to, how to make it uh, a lot How can it be automated easier. as much as it can, but then it, I think something that came up earlier is the user-friendly interface. It's got to be something that doesn't frighten them by putting horrible, mm. ugly, pointy brackets in there. You need a nice, smooth interface where you can actually choose. This is happens in the Bentham project as well. Mm. You can either go straight into the TEI uh, XML interface, or you can just type in normal ASCII characters. Yeah, and it would be good to kind of take the people who've done this sort of course and, and channel them into crowdsourcing things like, like Katie's. Um, you know, if you've if you enjoyed this, now try yes. this, and you can actually well, contribute. You've got them, keep them warm, yeah. keep them motivated. Sorry, this question. Um, That was one of the responses to the feedback was, oh, this is very Western-centric. So in Digging Deeper 2, we had um, Arabic um, and Chinese manuscripts. And music. Yeah, and music <coughs> manuscripts. So we sort of, but, I mean, each of them could be a, a MOOC on its own. I think that, that that's, uh, it's true that there's scope for, for expanding in all these areas, definitely. Yeah, just one, one last one. I just want to add, in response to that, that it wasn't it that Indigity 2, what you wanted to show was the range of possibility that actually we could work to. And so if you keep on focusing, 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 my worry sometimes also with my students, if they only focus on one type of manuscript and, and they don't really realize that there is much more. So there was also that sort of pedagogical idea beyond the deeping, digging deeper truth, to, which was based also on the manuscript 
you know, how we selected the minds of the, the UN. Um, so, you know, the, yeah, there was a pedagogical rationale, it wasn't just a chapter on the. I found fantastic, especially the, the part from the Arab manuscript was amazing mm. from my point of view. I learned a lot. Yeah, I learned a lot from that. I mean, that, that's, it was really nice to have to have that in there, definitely. Yeah.